My talk is about custom elements and how we can use them today. Um, there's my Twitter handle, and, my, um, and the presentation is actually at michaelmack.org slash presentations already. So you can test the Wi-Fi if you want to. OK, so who am I? I uh, did Java for about eight years out in Denver. And then I moved to Omaha about three years ago. I'm, I'm really loving it. And I've been doing Java, uh, JavaScript and web development ever since. Uh, I work for a company called Aviture. Uh, we're here based in Omaha, and we're kind of way out west by the highway. Um, but we do a, a wide range of things from everything from like startups all the way up to like defense contracting. A uh, really great company, and uh, they, help, they help sponsor me for this stuff. Um, OK, so agenda. What are custom elements? Um, some examples. I'm going to kind of show you some examples on using them today. And then uh, talk about uh, kind of what Christian was talking about. Can we really use these things today? Um, and I'm going to say, I'm going to try to tell you and convince you that, yes, you can. OK, so first, what are custom elements? Um, and custom elements are part of a wider thing called web components. So let's kind of talk about that really quick. This is one of those things Christian did mention in his talk of uh, web components are they're, they're, they're kind of tricky, right? So web components are four different uh, specs. Um, custom elements, which we're going to talk about today. Um, templates, which are kind of inert DOM that you can put into your, into your document without actually having the browser try to render those things. Shadow DOM, which is really cool, uh, but really far-reaching technology, which lets you kind of break out a whole piece of, of your document and ha not have it be affected by global scope and, and CSS and all that sort of thing. And then HTML imports for kind of bundling all this stuff together and, and publishing it in a, in a, in a consistent way. Um, but we're going to be focusing on custom elements. All right, so in real brief, what a custom element is, is it lets you define your own tag in the browser. Um, and what you see here uh, is, is pretty much what you might actually get in, for a custom element. You will write a custom element. The only um, caveat for this is that you need to um, put a dash in your, in your element name. OK, so great, awesome. What, so what can they do? Um, and let's, let's talk about that. So what do custom elements do? They let you add behavior to your elements. So this is like JavaScript. You can take, uh, write an element and have JavaScript execute when it's, when it's attached or um, removed from the DOM, uh, and actually add extra behavior as well while it's in there. Um, and this second one is, to me, the biggest, the biggest one, is it allows you to reuse components that are your custom elements that you define, allows you to reuse these across all frameworks. So you do not have to worry about if you build this thing, oh, it's, it's a React component. It only works in React. Or it's an Angular directive. It only works in, in Angular. Or this is a backbone view. It only works if you use that. Uh, anyone can then, in, once they import and get custom elements in their browser, they are able to use your custom element and just insert it um, and, and actually forget about it. Um, the other thing that they let you do is they write, let you write your own tag names. So uh, if you ever open up Gmail in, your, in Chrome DevTools and you look at the, the the DOM tree is just div, 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 all the way down. Um, so you don't really know what any of those things are doing. Um, and but with the custom element, you can kind of see this and say, OK, hopefully the, the authors gave it a name that uh, increases that readability and lets you know what it does. OK, so let's find out how we are going to create and use these web components. There's three steps. I'm a Marco Rubio, you guys. <coughs> all right, so first one you do, uh, you shim it. Then you register that, that um, you got shim to get this custom elements feature into your, um, into your browser. Um, two, you register it. And then three, you go ahead and just use it. So let's talk real quick on how you shim it. Uh, you just put this script tag in your, in your um, DOM. Or you include it as part, of a, uh, as part of your package manager, your bundler, right? Um, right here is there's web components JS. This is one of the shims. Um, and you just include it. It's actually fairly small. And we'll, we'll talk about that later. OK, so here's how you register your custom elements. Um, I'm going to zoom in so everyone can see that code OK. All right, so first we create a prototype that your custom element is going to inherit from. Um, it inherits from HTML element, that prototype, um, that, because what you're building is an element, right? Um, and then after that, you can, you can attach these methods to it. Uh, this one, uh, I'm going to use one called attached callback. And this callback will get called any time your, your element is uh, parsed or created or newed up and, and attached into the DOM. Um, and then finally, after you build out your prototype uh, of what you want your element to do, you say document.registerElement, you give it a name, and you pass the prototype in there, um, and, and then you're done. All right, so that seems really easy. Um, and then 
we can use it. So I'm going to use a, a you know, simple jQuery here, and I'm just going to take the body and append, and I'm just going to write the tag out there, append it to, to the body. And what you'll get in your console log, based on our previous function, is I've been attached to DOM. And the this that I sent in there um, is actually going to be the HTML element of your DOM. So all the methods you define on your prototype are going to, use, are going to have that this, which is uh, your DOM element. All right. Um, there's more elements that, that you can add. So attach callback is, is one of the special ones that will get called every time you attach uh, that element gets put into the DOM. Um, there's also detached, um, which, is, which happens whenever uh, your element is kind of ripped out of the DOM. So if you set up listeners or you set up special things that like state for your particular element, you want to tear down that state here. Um, and then there's this attribute change callback. So um, when you're defining elements, like think of select or, or input or the checkbox, elements, uh, they always have attributes. That's kind of their API. And the custom element spec writers are trying to say you should use attributes as your API for your custom element. So whenever those attributes change and someone sets them either via jQuery or using um, DOM methods, you're going you're gonna to want to know probably because they're, they're going to try to send in commands to you. So this is what happens when uh, this function is called whenever that happens. OK. But that's not all. You can even add more methods. So for example, you can add any method you want. So I want to add a hide to make my element kind of disappear uh, when it's clicked. So I can uh, do proto.hide, and I just say this.style.display equals none. And that's, I mean, that's, you may not want to do it this way, um, but this is kind of just demonstrating it, right? So then I can go and query my, my, for my element, and I can call .hide on it, and that will actually uh, hide the element. Um, the other thing that, um, this is probably a poor example, you can also j jQuery it, right? But the key thing with jQuery is it, it wraps every element when you, when you grab it with a jQuery uh, kind of wrapped element. So you want to get into that um, with, by this zero selector and uh, then call hide on it there. All right, cool. So how can I, but how can I use this for real, right? I mean, my element, who wants to just console log their, their thing when it gets on, on there? So I'm going to give you a couple, three ideas. Hopefully they're going to give you kind of a, uh, a kind of a idea of the power of what these things can do, and hopefully they're going to be useful for you. So anyone here ever work with, like, drop-down elements? Uh, I'm talking, like, bootstrap or, uh, I hear, I saw some, no, that's great. Uh, <laughs> but most of you have, right? Um, uh, Bootstrap, or, or I use, uh, we like Semantic UI is, is one, uh, or there's Foundation. They all have these, these what they call modules, and you have some, uh, you have some, some markup, and then you, you classify it with a, a class, and then you kind of say, okay, this is my drop down, and you, ha you have what, what's going to name, what's the name of the title, and then after that you have what's going to be shown whenever that drop down is kind of clicked, right? Um, Okay, so for example, I've taken that, that DOM that I just showed you guys, and I put it into my, into my uh, presentation, and I'm trying to click on uh, drop down. Oh, but you know what? These things, have, uh, these things have JavaScript, right? And it's not enough just to include that JavaScript on the page, which I've done. I have to actually initialize this JavaScript. So I'm going to take this, this method here, uh, this uh, you know, initialization code, and go ahead and click on that and e execute it in my browser. Oops. And then now you'll see my, my drop down works, right? So, great. Uh, that's not too bad to have to do that, right? To, to for, forget to initialize it and then actually do it. Especially if you have a static site, you can just grab all the drop downs in your site and say dot drop down and initialize it just the way you want. Um, but, you know, I work in a lot of very dynamic websites where we're inserting this stuff all the time. So, we use a lot of backbone, and every time I insert DOM with this drop down code in, into my uh, my application, I have to remember, oh, yeah, I need to update the dropdown. Or if I add anything, maybe I need to update the dropdown so it knows how to, to position everything uh, correctly. So that's really annoying. It, it's polluting my code. And it should be something that I think just happens automatically. I, I want to make this dropdown a full element into my, in my system where I don't have to worry about it. It's just, a, it's just another thing to like a select box. Um, and so here's how custom elements can kind of help in this, in this regard. So I'm going to go ahead and define this custom element uh, with my dropdown. And uh, I'm using global jQuery here, but you know, if you use a module system or something, you can, you can import these and build a module that does this for you. Um, but I'm doing a couple things in the attach callback here. I'm, I'm going ahead, and, and if they forgot to add the classes I need for the, my dropdown to work, which in this case are UI and dropdown, uh, I'm going to automatically add them. If, if not, it's a no-op. And then I'm going to go ahead and initialize my dropdown just right here. So whenever my, this, my semantic dropdown element gets attached to the DOM, it's going to 
uh, automatically initialize itself. So that's kind of neat. Um, also for fun and uh, kicks and giggles, I went ahead and, and added another method on, on, my, uh, on my element called dot toggle. And this will actually call the library, it's kind of call the library and try to toggle my dropdown for me. So now I can toggle it without, uh, uh, via JavaScript. Okay, so I go, on, go ahead and register my, my element and give it, send it the prototype just like before. And then um, I use it, right? So I've got my semantic dash dropdown. Remember that dash is important. Um, I've gone ahead and added the class because I'm, I'm a good uh, user, but I can also not do it. I can make it fault tolerant. And then I have all this stuff un under here. Uh, this is all just, these, this internal stuff is just normal internal things, right? So um, you can access those things inside your custom element, but uh, you, don't, you don't encapsulate that in a special thing like Shadow DOM. That's where Shadow DOM would come, come into. Um, but the good news is I did not have to initialize uh, this dropdown. Uh, it just automatically works, right? I just inserted that into my slide. I'm HTML slides, yay. Um, but it, they just kind of worked automatically. Okay, so that's, that's one example. Um, the next example I wanted to talk about was the time element. And you guys probably have seen this all over the before. Um, but first off, did you guys even know that there was an element in HTML5 called time? Someone knew. Some people knew. Good job. You guys win. Um, you can get a Nick Nisi badge. It's in your... Um, it's in your uh, bag of swag. Um, but here's how that actual, that time works, right? So uh, you can say the after party starts at, uh, at 20 hundred hours, right? Uh, actually, I don't know if that's right. No, it's not. <laughs> um, 1800. Uh, okay, so the idea here is, I, I, I don't know the intent of the time element, but no one uses it because it doesn't really do anything for you. Um, but what if we wanted more, right? What if I put a time element in there, I gave it a time, a date timestamp, and then it just did stuff for me automatically. For example, uh, I'm using that, a, a, a custom element called time uh, that, uh, did you guys see that? It, started, it said 15 minutes ago, now it says 16 minutes ago. Um, this is an auto-updating time element based on when I gave it my time of when I started this presentation, it initialized it for me. And uh, as, that, as time goes through, it, it's, just a, it's just an element in my DOM but it's auto-updating itself with the correct time. So it's, it's a really kind of, it's really cool sort of example of a, of a custom element. Um, and if you go to GitHub and you see your commit list uh, commits and when they happen, it's using this time element right now. The other thing this time element can do is uh, do locale aware time. So if your browser is set up to say, I prefer my dates to look uh, one April versus April one, it, it can grab that and use that as well. Okay, so how do you, uh, so I've already, I've already uh, told you guys this, but it's uh, GitHub's time element extension library. Um, and all it is is a custom element. It's, using, it's expecting you to use that shim, and then once you do, it, will, it just kind of works anytime you put that DOM in there. I'll show you how to use it. Um, to use it, it's real simple. You include their definition, and this is really calling the document register element after they build out a prototype, just like I showed you. Um, and then you use it. So you insert a time element, um, and this is, is uh, it's basically saying extend the time element, and, but add my extra stuff on there. Um, and I, I want it to be relative time. And then you pass in your date time string. And this is a key thing, uh, if you want to really be fault tolerant for your t uh, elements, is you add in a, <clears throat> a fallback. So if the browser doesn't understand time or relative time, it's gonna fall back and say, this is, look, I don't know what this is, but it's fault tolerant. I'm just gonna put whatever you put in here as the content. So if, if for some reason they've got JavaScript turned off or something, you will still get the actual date and you would want to you know, kind of put that in there. Okay, so that's, that's two examples. Um, let's go back to our dropdown. Um, the other one is, uh, so Semantic and Bootstrap, they all have these uh, callback mechanisms anytime your dropdown changes. So if someone selects something, you want to do, you want to change, uh, you want to have that event kind of be triggered and know and react to it in your application. Uh, very common sort of thing, and they all provide these uh, methods that let you say, on change, here's your value, here's the, the, old, the, the new value, the selected item, and then uh, the text of, of that item. Um, so fairly easy, and everyone's probably done something very similar like this. Um, but again, it's now in my, in my views or my, my, apps, my library or whatever I'm using to develop this, I have to know about dropdown, I have to register this event and then send my own custom uh, functions in there to to change it. Um, so I would like, if we're moving towards elements, right, what are the, what are the, um, the API for us in dealing with elements are, are events and DOM events. So when you change a select box, you get an event. When you, people type into the input box, you get an event. 
it would be nice if I'm, if I'm building this cool semantic dropdown thing, I could also get events from the DOM. And those things could be, they get all the benefits of DOM events. They bubble up, so you don't have to be right there to get it. You don't have to register your thing. Um, so that's what we're doing here. Um, so I, uh, here's my attached callback. I'm going ahead in that class. It's sl slightly different. Um, calling dot dropdown, that initializes it, but then I also register my on change. And then I call this method. Whenever that thing is, happens, I call um, this function I define called trigger event <coughs> um, with that item. So that's the DOM thing that started, that, that started the event. And then uh, I just name what my event is. Um, I'm not going to go, for time reasons, I'm not going to talk about how you trigger an event, but it's, it's very easy. Um, OK, so now I've got a, an improved dropdown, right? In many cases, I don't even need to know that that dropdown is there. It's, it looks and acts just like any other element that I have in my, in my application. And I think that's a really great thing um, because it keeps our code um, cleaner. It, you work on kind of what you're looking to do. And, and ha the fact that you have a, an extra widget in there doing things, it's kind of like that time element. I don't need to worry about it, if, especially if I don't need to worry about it. I don't have to. Um, but if I do, the other thing, nice thing about this, I can still go in and grab that semantic element and, and call a dot dropdown on it. It's underneath the covers. It's still a, a semantic UI thing. So if I need extra functionality that I don't want to build into that element, I can do that right there. OK, so use of custom elements. Um, I showed you guys the jQuery plugin. So the semantic dropdown, that's a, that's a jQuery plugin. Uh, a lot of jQuery plugins either need the, um, the DOM to be in the system, uh, especially if they're doing like height management and that sort of thing. Uh, so using that attach callback is a really great uh, way of, of saying, I know this thing is in the DOM. Now go calculate your height and position yourself wherever you want. Um, so small, fully can contained components like the time element are, are good. Uh, use cases uh, for custom elements. Uh, I showed you guys library events to, uh, to DOM events. <clears throat> Other things you can think of, I mean, so the, 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 it's wide open here, right? So we can use these to kind of help manage our, our if you're using like layouts or uh, you're trying to build like components or widgets uh, or like containers, uh, custom elements would be great for that. And then really whatever you can think of. Um, okay, so, the quite, so I've kind of introduced you guys to custom elements. Where, are they going to change? The way you do development? No, they're not. They're, they're a small tool for your development toolbox, kind of the, the title of my talk, right? Um, you should use them wherein, um, when it makes sense. Um, it really it depends. So when you have a need to, uh, a prime examples are uh, you're in your organization and you have these shared components that everyone's using over and over again, and they're all doing like the same thing um, because you all, you're all using the same sort of drop-down library or something like that. Uh, make those uh, custom elements and, and, and share them out there. And then whether your users are, are Angular, React, or, or whatever, you know, star, um, they can use them right away. All right, so should you use them? Yes. Okay, so here's where we got to, uh, coming back to like, Christian's talk, right? Uh, web components aren't ready for production, right? Um, they're that shiny thing the browsers aren't doing anything in. Um, and here, uh, black... Using the term black hole for Safari is great because it really is how they uh, seem to work. Um, <clears throat> but this is the components browser implementation, right? And I think you, you guys will say, OK, but Mike, look, custom elements. They're, they're also, there's a black hole for custom elements, too. Um, and Edge is still uh, working on them. Um, so why? Why, why, um, why are these things still not out there? Um, it's been years since these web component specs have been out, announced. And uh, <clears throat> specs are out there. Why aren't the browsers implementing them? Um, I think it's a, a good question of not invented here. Uh, Google has kind of pushed these things, and uh, maybe they're a little too primary of the pusher, and everyone's like, well, that's great for you, um, but you kind of need all of us on board. And so, so we have uh, a set of polyfills that help us with these uh, web components, right? Polymer is the biggest and most well-known, and also uh, run by Google, right? Um, but they're still widely considered not ready for production. And I think part of that is because some of these web component specs are really uh, big features. This idea of Shadow DOM is uh, uh, really uh, difficult to just kind of force into a browser environment that's not used to it. Um, it's also big. So Shadow DOM, well, actually, I can't talk about it because I'm running out of time. Um, <coughs> Um, but the good news is that custom elements are not shadow DOM. You know, the browser handles custom elements kind of already. It kind of has a fallback mechanism of when you're, when you're um, there. Um, but because of that, they're, they're a lot easier to polyfill. So uh, if you are interested in using these today, and I encourage you to, to do so, 
Um, there are two components, or two shims out there uh, that work for polyfills. Um, one is webcomponents.org. They're the uh, kind of Google and Firefox got together and made this site, and they're, that they have a, a, their, their official set of polyfills, but they're not official. Um, the other one is uh, document register element. And if I have, a, I have that up here. Um, the cool, it's just this guy, he's like, you know what, uh, the, the Polymer uh, Web Components Polyfill, they say, well, we're only going to target modern browsers, and that's great. But this guy's like, you know what, I, I think we can target more. And so he, he went ahead and built his own shim um, that works uh, via, all, it does all the things, um, and it's smaller, it's tested on more browsers, and he's tested on all the, the Android browsers, and, all, and he even tested on a BlackBerry OS uh, browser. So anyway, uh, and it works. So uh, those are the, your two choices. Um, it depends on kind of where you're targeting uh, and whether you want to feel like more like you're in the mainstream with Web Components JS or if you're using document register element. The other great news is that these shims are actually very small. Min and G, uh, gzipped, there's either five kilobytes or only three kilobytes. And when you think of like just loading an image or something like that in your, in your, um, in your application, uh, that's almost nothing. And to get the power of these, and you only have to load it once, right? After that, you can use all your elements and, and, and you're good to go. Okay. So custom elements, uh, I, I call them a tool for your developer toolbox. And I, I want you guys to, to start thinking in, in these custom elements. I think it'll help uh, move us towards this com web components thing and give us some um, kind of start in that direction. We're not going to be able to do all the full power of what Web Components promises us yet, but it'll start us thinking and say, oh, that could be a nice custom element. And um, the other thing I, I want to say is, is these are things have been out there for a while, but we're all so obsessed of, oh, I want the whole Web Components. It's not worth even trying unless I get my shadow DOM. And, and, and from Christian's talk, we, we know we're not going to get there for a while. I mean, Safari, they're, they're finally making progress on these things, um, but they're not, it's not going to happen anytime soon, and even then, the shimming for some of these features is, is going to be a ways out. But um, the, the, sh the shim for custom elements is there. We can use it. It's been tested. It's production ready. And it gives us a lot of power right now. So uh, my, my, what I'm asking for you guys is, is to take a look at them and uh, worry about the other stuff later. It'll come. OK, so that's all for me. I, I have like three minutes for questions, if anyone has any. That's a, that's a great question. The question was, is the is attribute uh, part of the standard and or is it uh, new um, or is it extra? And the answer is, right now it's part of the standard, um, but the standard is still kind of uh, morphing a little bit. Uh, just uh, the other day, they got all the browser vendors. They're starting to talk, which is great. They actually started getting together, and they were talking about the is um, attribute, and uh, they're still kind of working. There's a little bit of flux in there. Um, so the nice thing is I'm using GitHub's time element, so when they update it, I can, I can update it. And it also has that fallback. So my preference when I'm using these things is to find my own. And um, the other uh, area of, of flux still, even though there's, the spec is out there, uh, the other area of flux in this is the created callback. So I, I try to use only the attached callback to, to be extra safe um, for, for using custom elements. So there's, the, the standard could still morph. Um, even though it's, it's out there as a, as a recommendation. Um, but uh, yeah, there's definitely ways to continue to use them and still be uh, very safe. The attached callback, for example, is definitely in, in there, and there's not really any discussion about those. All right, uh, that's all for me. Thank you um, very much. <laughs> <laughs>